excellent speaker, Dr. David Naylor, who is a strong supporter of our sector. For those of you who may not know Dr. Naylor, he was appointed the 15th president of the University of Toronto in 2005. Dr. Naylor. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren, and thank you for the privilege of addressing you tonight. As with all privileges, I know this one comes with some responsibilities. Your stomachs are empty. You have only the salad course. I stand between you and all the courses of dinner. I'm also due out the door at 7.10 p.m. <laughs> so this is what management consultants call an alignment of incentives. <laughs> That's something that almost never happens in the Canadian healthcare system. Now, I'm very glad that TBI is recognizing and celebrating the outstanding achievements of four remarkable individuals and a very exciting emerging company and honored to be the warm-up act for your evening with John Dirks, Murray McLaughlin, Greg Sabo, Mark Lepage, and Excel of Biosystems. I really have just five points to make tonight. I'll start just by making them as briefly as possible. First, we need to sustain our societal and industrial support for fundamental and applied health research. Second, Ontario has fabulous firepower in that respect, and the Toronto region in particular is wonderfully positioned to make a huge difference to the life sciences landscape through disciplinary excellence and through convergence with non-life sciences disciplines. Third, and this will be no surprise, we simply have to do better at translating our discoveries into new ventures. We need a stronger innovation ecosystem. Fourth, part of creating that improved environment means some serious rethinking of the healthcare system and how we make decisions within it. And last, I think you probably know all these things already. That's one of the reasons why TBI was created, why you're here. And our collective challenge is therefore equally obvious. We need to pull together the relevant stakeholders in the life sciences sphere, make our case more often, more persuasively, to leaders in the public and private sectors, but also be prepared to get on with innovating, regardless of whether the leaders themselves take action. And with that, I should probably leave the podium. You could get on with your food, we could have a drink, but I'm going to elaborate briefly on each of those points. First, we need research. And I said a few months ago on the occasion of the 50th anniversary gala of the Gairdner Foundation that fundamental and applied research in the life sciences has never been more important to human well-being than it is right now. And there's been substantial progress. All of the age-adjusted death rates from the major scourges falling in industrialized and industrializing countries. Billions of people living longer and better lives, albeit often living with one or more chronic diseases. And this progress has been due, unlike the 19th and early 20th century, not to public health and similar measures, sanitation, rise in standards of living, it has been due, at least in the developed world, so-called, to more effective prevention and management of a vast range of diseases. That's been enabled by advances in fundamental and translational bioscience, by clinical and epidemiological research, and by advances in the organization and delivery of healthcare. That said, our successes, ladies and gentlemen, are still quite mixed, and let me give you a few examples. From the world where I worked for many years before embarking into administration and suffering early brain death, <laughs> we fiddle brilliantly with blocked or narrowed arteries. The standard cocktail of medications prescribed after an acute myocardial infarction reduces medium-term mortality by up to 80%. And yet we still don't have a definitive intervention, a vaccine, if you will, that can prevent or reverse atherosclerosis. Cancer control huge strides, and yet all of us have been touched by cancer. We've had friends and family members who've lost their lives to this scourge. We still have a great deal to do in battling the protean manifestations of the proliferative disorders. We've eradicated smallpox and polio, and we can cure a great number of the infectious diseases of our time. 
And yet, here in a city that lived through SARS, in a world that lived through H1N1 and is still besieged by HIV, the infectious diseases are still taking a huge toll on our planet. We transform the management of inflammatory arthritis with immunobiological agents, incredible advances. But we still treat osteoarthritis of the hip and knee with carpentry, joint replacements. And there is with cardiac valve replacements or dialysis or organ transplantation, we're still in the spare parts business. We really haven't reaped the full benefits of regenerative medicine, be it through in situ regrowth of tissue or through in vitro bioengineering with subsequent transplantation matched unequivocally, completely to the patient himself or herself. Now it's true that we have to relentlessly and rigorously synthesize, critique, validate, apply the evidence we already have. Clinical prevention and public health still have untapped potential, could save millions of lives. And it's true that some two billion people worldwide still suffer because of dirty water and malnutrition, substandard housing, poor education, and oppressive political circumstances. And there, may I say, that in the presence of the ministry, we are so fortunate to have a vibrant democracy here in Ontario and in Canada. But we must rededicate ourselves to mitigating all of these shameful health disparities. Because we also know what comes next when those populations move out of the shadow of poverty. They fall prey to all of the chronic diseases that everyone in the audience has probably seen or lived with personally. And as that happens, the quest to cr conquer those chronic diseases, the marshalling of global forces to counter infectious diseases, both will become, more than ever, a great preoccupation for all of humankind. And so, to repeat, perhaps the single most important message for me of the night, we need great research in this space. We also need Ontario to be even more successful as a global life sciences hub. You know, natural resources are a huge comparative advantage for the Canadian economy. We've seen the decline, however, of the manufacturing sector here in Ontario. There is global arbitrage of manufacturing in general, and everyone recognizes the need to diversify our economy. That means more enterprises based on innovation, and it means a stronger culture of innovation everywhere. Life sciences are a logical priority in that regard. Ontario has numerous universities, colleges, research hospitals, and innovative companies, all contributing to create a huge and dynamic footprint in the life sciences. And a word here about the Toronto region. I know TBI now stands, the T stands for the, not Toronto. You've moved on, that's good. And I know Canadians love upstarts. They love the mythology of small but smart. That's understandable given our national self-identification as the small, and we'd like to think smart neighbor of the big bad USA. And I would add that not many Canadians love Hogtown. But there are two relevant realities here that we should recognize. One, Canada needs Ontario. Canada needs Ontario to be firing on all cylinders. It needs the economic engine of this federation. It's a basic principle of animal husbandry that you don't starve your cash cow. And second, Toronto matters, not just to the province, but to Canada as a whole. Consider this fact. On a proportionate basis, Toronto contributes more to Canada's GDP than New York, Chicago, Boston, and San Francisco combined contribute to the US. Staggering statistic. Unfortunately, we are positioned here and in Ontario at large to make a big difference. In North America, Toronto is third or fourth in the scale of its bioscience and healthcare sector. We compete effectively. You put all of Ontario together, we have something that is sitting, I believe, very close to first place across this continent in one of the powerhouses of the world. We have the third largest information and communications technology cluster in North America right here in the Toronto region. No other region is close. This week, an influential US venture capitalist published his global top 10 list of clean tech development clusters, green clean space. Mars in Toronto 
was ranked fourth worldwide. It's this concentration and convergence of disciplines that creates amazing opportunities, not just here in Toronto, of course, but right across Ontario, that we can mobilize and pull this incredible, diverse enterprise together. But as I noted, we don't have all the winning conditions. And that brings me to my third point. We're not doing well enough turning these great discoveries, these new technologies, into successful products and services. You know, it's somewhat puzzling to me. All this tremendous research, a massive publicly financed healthcare enterprise, and a sincere and growing local interest in development and commercialization of discoveries and new technologies. And everyone in the audience knows the catchphrases. Bench to bedside and beyond. So it sounds like Star Trek, doesn't it? <laughs> and then there's from genes to populations and back again. I liked that one when I was the Dean of Medicine. Or in the same vein, with an alliteration from molecules to marketplaces. But you know, the fancy phrases aside, we're missing some pieces. For starters, we urgently need more and better seed stage investment and more venture capital. This is a big challenge for Canada as a whole and for Ontario and for Toronto. We need a stronger culture of innovation in all of our universities, colleges, and hospitals, and I think that's really starting to happen. Just go along to Entrepreneurship 101 over at the Mars Centre. Hundreds of students turning up. The bug is spreading. This is a great contagion, an emerging infectious disease that we should encourage. We need Canadian companies to step up, to invest in Canadian-based R&D. And I know head offices sometimes have different views. They look and they say, it's not the best climate. Ladies and gentlemen, CEOs, we need you to step up. Nortel, whatever its management foibles, was such a leader in this regard. And we need all companies in all sectors, especially the health sphere, to pick up the slack. But we also need a stronger culture of collaboration between academia and industry. And I know those aren't always easy relationships. We value freedom of inquiry above all. Companies have to look to the bottom line. And yet I acknowledge that academic research is hugely subsidized by taxpayers through grants to individual scientists and by operating funding for universities, colleges, and hospitals. We owe it to our fellow citizens to ensure that our discoveries and technologies can be translated into products and services that will yield health gains for patients, but also economic benefits for the whole population. And on that front, one of our challenges in academia is that we still try to turn good ideas into fledgling inventions and startup companies way too early. We do need more proof of principle funding. We need the developmental capacity so that innovations carry practical weight when they're presented to potential investors or industrial partners. And otherwise, we end up doing one or more of three bad things. We waste our own time and money. We waste the time and money of our potential or actual partners. And perhaps worst of all, we end up selling off a promising invention or a company at bargain basement prices, usually to some American-based vulture capitalist concern. You know, there's a great deal more that can be said on this topic, but I just want to sum up briefly. Other small nations, Finland, Israel, and Singapore among them, are building innovation ecosystems with clarity about how all the pieces interconnect. And I will say in Canada, there is actually lots of government money in play in the technology transfer and commercialization space. We simply haven't deployed it very effectively, and there is a challenge to governments and a challenge to all of us to make the case, not for massive increased investment, but for better deployment, for fairness, transparency, strategic choices, so that we can put that money to use to grow the life sciences economy. Fourth point, and this is one that has troubled me increasingly in the years since I've moved away from primary engagement with healthcare and taken a longer look at it. The healthcare system should be an enabler of innovation, and too frequently in this country, it is not. I know we don't have a perfect environment for investment in novel drugs and medical devices, 
or healthcare software in Ontario? Yes. The incentive structures are better developed in Quebec, where so many of your tax dollars are hard at work. <laughs> However, if we look past the direct incentives to startups or to established companies, there's an elephant in the room, ladies and gentlemen. We spend about $45 billion through the public purse on healthcare in this province. It's not simply a set of costs that go into products and services to meet the needs of patients and communities. Healthcare is a value generator with huge advantages, both obvious and subtle. It contributes to and stimulates many sectors. As many will know, it helped subsidize the manufacture of cars in Ontario and was a huge comparative and competitive advantage for us. And in that latter regard, our quasi-healthcare system, with all its warts and shortcomings, is a sound alternative to the chaos and costs south of the border. But frankly, we have not moved the structure of that system forward to any meaningful degree since the mid-1990s. That's true not just in Ontario, but right across the country where the big push to regionalization took place over a decade ago. And since then, I would argue that oddly, we have been adrift. A core problem then and now is that costs and incentives are not appropriately aligned. Back to my earlier comment about your dinner and my departure time. And I know that that misalignment will come as no surprise to those in the audience tonight, but let me give you an example. Let's imagine we have a new and expensive device invented at McMaster or Western. It's installed at London Health Sciences Center. The installation shortens the patient's length of stay. It allows more intensive use of inpatient beds, no adverse outcomes. An economic analysis is undertaken. It confirms that while post-acute home care costs rise ever so slightly, the overall cost impact is extremely positive on an episode of care basis. Well, it's totally unclear how that device gets widespread adoption. Think about the incentives. The hospital is largely funded by a global budget an increased intensity of bed use is probably self-defeating because it isn't adequately rewarded in the reimbursement formula. And so it loses from being a first mover. There's a penalty for being a risk taker and facilitating adoption of a novel technology. The Community Care Access Centre, for its part, also faces potential increases in cost to provide the new post-acute services. They may or may not be offset. And as for the administrators, the doctors, the nurses, other health professionals who push to adopt a new device, what's the incentive for any of them to take on a new technology, a made in Ontario technology, that might become a world beater and generate jobs as well as better health outcomes? This type of silo-based budgeting bedevils the system. It bedevils the approval of new drugs and devices. It is a major barrier to innovation. So one way or another, we not only have to spend healthcare dollars more efficiently, we have to rejig our quasi-system so that it promotes and rewards the development and sensible field testing of new products and services, information systems, and management strategies. I should add that Henry Friesen and Cal Stiller were arguing for this type of reframing of our healthcare system over a decade ago. Nothing's happened. The arguments I've made about better integration, better budgeting, alignment of incentives go back even further. I and many others published them at least 15 years ago. Again, very little has happened. A system adrift, as I said earlier. So perhaps now with the unhappy attenuation of our manufacturing sector and the renewed economic pressures on the provincial budget, we can restart a serious dialogue about fundamental changes to create a system that facilitates innovation. Now those with stomach growling will be relieved that I'm on my final point. And I'm checking my watch and thinking my wife is getting angry, so I'll be quick. We know what we need to do. We're in a remarkable position here in Ontario. We have great opportunities. We have serious competitive advantages. And those advantages must be front and centre in our advocacy with public and private sector leaders. And with better collaboration and focused and strategic investments by all the relevant sectors, and some overdue reforms to our healthcare quasi-system, 
we can create a world-leading life sciences cluster in Ontario, one that fosters basic and applied research, that facilitates knowledge translation and innovation and commercialization, one that promotes a dynamic culture of creativity and entrepreneurship. The outputs, better educational opportunities for our students and trainees, more jobs, good jobs, greater prosperity, better patient care, and healthier populations at every stage of the life cycle. And on that point, make no mistake, the demographic time bomb will detonate in the years ahead. Achieving that vision, ladies and gentlemen, may not be immediately at hand, but it is entirely within our reach. And as I said earlier, if some of the decision makers won't listen, I recommend that we simply get on with the collaborations required to make some changes happen and to promote more innovation in the system. In this regard, I want to close by acknowledging the role of TBI. You're not only recognizing excellence as signified by the outstanding award winners you're celebrating this evening, you're also working hard, Lauren and colleagues, to tell our collective story to stakeholders and to governments. The story is already very good indeed, and if we work together, I'm convinced that it can become a truly great narrative of collective success. So again, thank you for inviting me to join you and my warmest congratulations to tonight's award winners. Bon appétit.